So I, I will jump right in on some use cases here, and thank you uh, so much for having me here. Um, I presented last year uh, about use cases and about what are the relevant use cases for blockchain. And, uh, and one of the key elements of that is just how much we need uh, uh, multiple chains and cross chains. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and this will go a little more technically deep than some of the other presentations. Uh, or, um, so the first is sort of the set of blockchains that we talked about are like driver credential verification. These were focused on freight, right? Driver credential verification, um, where I don't need to know the details of the driver I'm handing natural gas off to, but, our sh but I sure need to know that, um, that they're qualified to, to, to manage it. Um, chain of custody, right? You know, crucial low hanging fruit for any kind of freight scenario is high integrity, high assurance chain of custody that of course requires that driver authentication so I know who I'm actually handing off a package to. Um, payment for shipping transactions and in there you quickly get into multiple different kinds of payment arrangements. So simply paying in local currency so people can get their money out in local currency for international shipments, um, paying for uh, um, uh, having automated payments so that when custody changes, we automatically issue payment out to some of the recipients, at least partial payment, or having accounts receivables loans, where it might not be that I, as a shipper, get paid directly for, for doing my part of a multi-week shipment, but I can take accounts receivables so that I, as a small company, can have cash flow that is on the order of days rather than on the order of months. For getting paid for the work that my company does and that makes it easier to decentralize and so forth. Now these are some of the low-hanging fruit use cases we talked about last year and you've already heard several that are that are um, that are much more real and there's been an astonishing amount of progress since last year in terms of real actual deployment of this technology stuff. But um, the key thing about that and the key thing about several of these is they're on different chains. Right, the, the, the driver credential verification would be different from the payment mechanism. And what are some of the reasons for that? Right, well, data locality, right? In the Salesforce case, I mean, one of the things that we've, we, we've said to, to lots of people is, you know, there's the crypto side and the blockchain side of the world, but for real businesses in the mainstream business, which is the kind of thing that, you know, we and, 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 and a lot of people uh, out there listening are focused on, you know, you've got the other part of your business, like your CRM and your sales data and your tax information and all those things. So being able to have blockchain functionality that sits near that data is crucial. Um, similarly, if it's a credentialing system, it's got to sit near the credential data that is all very private data that I want to disclose and permission very, very carefully. And so privacy is a crucial element. Governance, who gets to decide who's in, who gets to decide who can see the data, how it gets analyzed, what kinds of transactions are allowed, all those kinds of things are different for different use cases, even when those use cases link together and, and, and connect with each other. And finally, specific capabilities. You'll hear lots of different models of how one might build the smart contract that glue all this kind of thing together. We have a very strong uh, uh, understanding of that, which I'll tell you a little bit about uh, in, in a moment, but that's one of the key elements that differentiates these systems, whether it's high frequency, low value transactions for games or low frequency, high value transactions for banks doing Forex for between each other. So what are the challenges? So let's, let's assume for the moment, I'll go a little bit more into use cases later, but I wanna step up for a moment and look at what are the challenges, right? These cross-chain use cases, just coming up with them last year was a challenge. Everyone was focused on private chain in order to solve their private problem that they have with, you know, that, that they used to solve with, you know, service-oriented computing or cloud-based computing. And this blockchain, you know, might have added something, but they were looking at solving exactly the same problems in exactly the same ways. And, uh, and, and, and spreading that out to actually focus on the use cases that really leverage blockchain technology and more importantly leverage linking of these different blockchains that was that's that's one of the challenges that that everyone here is starting to meet the second is technology development and most of my talk is going to be about that and so i'll, I'll dig deep into what's interestingly new and hard about linking blockchains and doing interoperability between blockchains 
And then the final challenge is one that we now face going forward over the next couple of years, which is how do we get this deployed? What's the value prop of deployments? Okay, so first a little bit of background and I'll go through this very, very quickly. Um, the, the Agor, you know, who is Agoric, right? Agoric was founded by pioneers in the space of distributed transactions, distributed systems. So I, I for example, worked on the first production smart contract back in 1989, long before blockchain. Mark Miller, our chief scientist, wrote the Agoric Open Systems Papers in 88 that really articulated software agents building and participating in markets. And we've done several other things. The key elements here are we're building a next gen uh, platform for smart contracts, um, both for public chains and private and consortium chains that allow the millions of developers in the world um, that are familiar with the, the most popular programming language JavaScript to safely write composable smart contracts. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in that, but I wanted that sort of as a background. The key thing here is we are co-creators of the inter-blockchain communication product protocol along with um, uh, the ICF, the, the Foundation for Cosmos, AIB who built Tendermint and, and, and several other participants in the community. And so that comes out of some of our earlier work, again, before blockchain in doing large scale distributed systems. So first, what's a smart contract? And since, since I talked about our background in smart contract, that's an important element um, to make sure that we're all on the same page about. And, and for the last 30 some odd years since before blockchain, a smart contract to us is an arrangement between multiple parties, a contract like arrangement that we can express in software, we can express in code where the behavior of that code, the behavior of that program enforces the terms of the contract. Now I said this predates blockchain, right? We did this with cryptographic protocols between machines long before blockchain. And smart contracts are upwards of a trillion dollars or more in market cap, depending on which, what you look at. So eBay is a smart contract. Buyers and sellers are completing a, a sale transaction enforced by software that is running at eBay that handles automated you know, provisioning of delivery, automated payment, dispute resolution, and, and, and a tiny fraction of transactions get escalated to, for, to humans to sort out, right? And so eBay, PayPal, Venmo, uh, Airbnb, um, uh, Uber and Lyft, much of Amazon, high frequency trading and brokerage houses, those are all third parties being able to coordinate through a trust, you know, or independent parties being able to coordinate through a trusted third party. So what does blockchain bring to that, right? What blockchain brings is multiple independent computers that are administrated differently, that are administrated in different administration zones and in different jurisdictions. Now realize this is the gold standard of blockchain, right? So now I've got a set of machines that are all independent, that, that cannot be compromised by any one individual organization that vote to agree with cryptographic technology, high assurance and so forth on the data. So what's the package, the order of events, the choices, who am I delivering that package to and did it get there and did it get there before or after I got paid and the results of computation when we add smart contracts to it. So, so, you know, was the amount with the taxes and the duties in the location at that time of day with that exchange rate paid to the right person at the right time. And it's several computers that are independently functioning doing this. And as a result, you get what we consider to be computing with integrity, right? You've got, you've got strong, you know, unassailable cryptographic technology providing a high assurance across these multiple different machines that they agreed that I took the package at thus and such time and, was, and, and you got paid for it, right? And so one of the things that does for smart contracts is it gives us the ability to have a trusted third party that isn't another organization, right? My company can work directly with my customers to agree on terms that, you know, we, that both sides really need to make sure are enforced that, 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 that represent different parts of an arrangement that, that both, that are, that are, that both of us would like to um, uh, make sure our part really happens correctly. And we can now run this in, in an environment that we can rely on. And we can connect it to data that is secret to both of us and not available to anyone else. Or we can connect it to our data systems like, you know, in, in the previous discussion with Salesforce, with specifications that are committed that will be verified by third parties and so on. So that's what blockchain is. Okay. 
So with that, we now look back at some of those use cases I talked about and the, the elements of those use cases that you see in freight actually resonate across lots of different industries. So the same authentication and credential verification I need in freight to verify that the driver I'm handing off to is trained in liquid natural gas so I can safely give him this, give him this, uh, give him this, uh, this cargo. Um, a brokerage house needs for their traders to be able to prove that they have training and assurance um, uh, for handling Vanguard funds without revealing all the details of the traders and thus allowing their competitors to analyze and track the trading patterns inside of this brokerage house, right? And it's the same training certification. It's the same authentication process. Similarly, accounts receivables, loans versus freight, very, very much the same problem as accounts receivables loan against residuals on a music contract, right? Proof of location for freight, you know, in order to do a detention use case, I would want to use the same technology on a zone that is specialized, on a, on a blockchain that's specialized for proof, for proof of location. I'd want to use the same technology um, to be able to, to, to control the sales regions for, for, for um, concert tickets in a, in a, in a ticketing venue and so forth. And so making those, so that's one of the, the other drivers that a lot of people aren't aware of is when they think about their use cases, the, the services they need that they need to trust, that they need the reliability in, are much more general than one particular vertical. Okay, so what do we mean by interoperability? In a, remember I said that it's agreement between machines. So this stack of machines on the left is just a set of machines. I happen to pick the Agora chain, but it's the same for, most, for, 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 for all the actually cryptographically strong chains out there where those machines are going to agree. And there's a thing we call a light client in, the, in, in, in jargon, which is not verifying each and every transaction, it's able to verify that all of the machines involved in that blockchain agree that they executed consistently. So I didn't check your credentials. I checked that all of the machines involved, all the hundred machines that might be participating in the private blockchain or the consortium blockchain to do credential verification did in fact agree that you have liquid natural gas credentials. Awesome. So interoperability then, or the, you know, the, the focus of it that I'm going to talk about here is where two chains um, each have a light client for the other and they're verifying that the other side is executing according to its design plan, according to its consensus agreements. And it's providing application data and asset money, digital rights and so forth, as application data and asset transport and the additional wrinkle that you require in blockchain is the ongoing assurance of integrity that you get from that light client verification on either side. Okay, and that's the thing that's novel and that's what makes this hard in a way that prior systems to blockchain were not hard, right? But it's very analogous to TCP, you know, and HTTPS and so forth. And so, you know, what is IBC? So, so I'll focus on a particular interoperability protocol, IBC, the Interblockchain Communication Protocol. And that's really messaging, you know, designed for messaging among chains and individual machines. It's designed for broad adoption. So it's absolutely blockchain neutral. Um, and there are indeed multiple implementations for different blockchains happening. It's all open sourced. Um, it is permissionless, so you can extend it in ways that don't require approval of the standards boards and so forth. And so it's something that's really designed to enable the blockchain industry as a whole and the distributed system industry as a whole to advance forward in the same way that Beta is doing that kind of thing um, for, uh, for freight. And what it does is it really captures and abstracts out the best practices that people have developed across a wide variety of efforts to be able to do blockchain interoperability. Um, so between Ethereum and Bitcoin, between, you know, uh, Cosmos, Zones, Polkadot, everything else. Okay, so it is a layered protocol, just like, you know, TCP, if you're familiar with that, right? That's a network protocol of the internet um, that, that some of us were, you know, were, were there at the early days of, right? And so, so TCP has, has the part that is hard to implement that everyone has to do exactly right. And then there's the application stuff that's built on top of it. So we call... We call the, the, the bottom layer the tau, the transport of packets and data and resources, authentication and ordering those. And then there is the application protocol. And that's the permissionless extensible thing that each application might grow their own. So transfer of money, 
proof of location, chain of custody, loan information, beta standards, you know, every, everything that people might want to be able to securely and in a trustworthy fashion share is done via, uh, is done as an application protocol the same way that our communication protocols happen above TCP. So let's dig into the details. Oh, wait, well, no, no, that's a little bit, that's a little bit too deep, but I did want to note that, that this diagram here, which is one of the many diagrams and in, the, in, in the specification process that happened through all of this thing, right? My talking to you right now happens over a tech stack that is equally complicated. And yet the way you all got here was by pushing a button and then fumbling and restarting your computer and all that sort of thing. But nonetheless, fundamentally, you're pushing a button and all sorts of magic, interesting protocol for resource management and so forth happened underneath. This is one of the diagrams for the tau layer of, of IBC that indeed I mentioned there's a light client verification and packets going and networks voting and all that sort of thing. But fundamentally developers can build amazing stuff on top of this without understanding this level of detail. And, and users will be able to use it by, you know, taking their package scanner and scanning a package and lo and behold, it goes from their chain of custody thing out to an accounts receivable uh, loan and suddenly uh, more cash becomes available for them to be able to pay their, 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 their staff, right? Okay, so what's the status of IBC? IBC is, is, you know, one of the main things about IBC is it's, it is the primary loosely coupled blockchain or interop protocol that, that allows radically different blockchains to cooperate with each other in a sound and coherent fashion that we can have high assurance of the security of. So there is a complete, in this case, primarily English language specification available. It has been implemented for the Cosmos SDK. Cosmos is, is um, uh, uh, the... Um, first early big um, proof of stake network out there um, that supports multiple zones as they call them communicating, but, and, and they were one of the original drivers of the, of the um, uh, IBC specification. Um, there are you know, other implementations in progress for everything from how do we do it on Ethereum to the Polkadot network to Ethereum, well, I mentioned Ethereum, um, uh, to you know, various other, all the different zones in, 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 in Cosmos and other third party chains. There was a hackathon for this in April where applications on one chain were using Oracle information from another chain and paying for it from yet a third chain. And finally, there is Game of Zones that is literally wrapping up right now, even as we speak, they're giving out prizes for the Game of Zones. And Game of Zones is critical. So I'll say just a little more about that. It's Think of it as pen testing, penetration testing for an interop protocol. So it's an adversarial test net with, you know, 160 some odd different chains and validators and participants and, you know, and, and, and different chains that are all competing with each other to attack, but use the network at the same time, send through high volumes of transactions, you know, try to compromise the, the security of the monetary transactions that are built on it, the money and resource protocols and so forth. And it literally just wrapped up. So IBC is heading towards production. It will eventually get the vote to, for incorporation into um, the Cosmos network. Um, people are working on bridging it to other networks, as I mentioned. So this stuff is heading towards production and, and anticipated this year. And you know, the, the, uh, um, Hyperledger Burrow has, a, has tasks open to be able to integrate it into Hyperledger. So it is absolutely something that, 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 that we expect to see hit the world. Okay. So I've got one more minute here. Let me wrap up with the, the last set of challenges. That's sort of addressing the technical challenges that mostly, you know, you guys don't have to deal with. But the deployment challenge, we talked about the use case challenge. The deployment challenge is the next one. You know, interop is totally useless until there's someone else to interop with, right? When phones first came out, someone was quoted as saying, you know, I can, I can envision a world where there'll be one of these phones in every town in the country, right? Um, interop is more valuable the more things I can connect to. And so as people, but, but it is inevitably important because of this shared use of services, because of the increased actual value of, of, of having one use case connect to another, right? Because, you know, that's the way business works. That's the way economy works. And so, and so in the meantime, you know, you want to focus on interop, but you can use it for innovation. You can use it so that it's safe to pick any particular infrastructure for your private chain, because with good interop, 
you'll be able to bridge to the rest of the world and be able to use those other services in an application, right? So it's, it's a valuable thing to be able to commit to, um, to enable innovation and pivoting and growth going forward. But a key thing is build on the tech stacks that actually have cryptographic integrity, that actually have, you know, like, like Tendermint, even for enterprise, like Tendermint, where the voting that happens has, an, has a cryptographic audit log that, that, that has, um, has been, you know, tested in security, battle tested for real monetary transactions and so forth. Some of the enterprise systems, yeah, they don't do that yet. So they need to be pushed to cross that, that line. So it's not that just that your business that deployed a private chain trusts their system. It's that your business can show the security and audit trail so another business out there that's interoperating with your chain can actually trust that your chain didn't get compromised by some disgruntled employee or, or, or some incorrect deployment, right? Having that high assurance is critical to be able to grow this future economy of high assurance interaction um, through smart contracts. And then focus on these kind of use cases where blockchain really adds value, where the integrity matters, where you're using third parties and enabling new kinds of cooperation between them. And then think about for every, for pretty much every such use case that integrity and third parties, you know, safe cooperation actually matters, just about every single one of them benefits from being able to link to a financial underwriting or being able to trigger some other business property that happens on some other blockchain. So for all these use cases, at least at some point, step back and think about what it would mean when it was connected to the rest of the, to the rest of the interchain world, right? And then finally, when you deploy, deploy in such a way that interop is enabled. Deploy such that, you know, three months from now, when you want to connect that supply chain to somebody else's supply chain that's going to supply some other part of your system, you have the ability to do so without it being a tear down your proof of concept and deploy something new. So I'll close with, you know, what we really need a more vibrant world, a more vibrant economy of connected systems rather than more walled gardens, right? So, so, so focus on not, you know, start with a private chain, start with a consortium, consortium chain, that's great. They need private data, but really think about how you connect to the rest of the world. Learn IBC or other interop protocols, come to the upcoming hackathon in July, be able to use it, deploy real use cases with it, learn the Agoric system so you can build the next generation of, of smart contracts, of course and integrate into this world the beta standards you can, that, that, that can help all of us here coordinate in various ways. So thank you all very much for your time. Sorry for running a minute here over. But we'll take a couple of questions, I hope. Awesome, thank you so much, Dean. I always love the energy you bring to the table. <laughs> My phone has been blowing up with messages saying, you know, what's in his coffee? <laughs> um, Tim Marsh from GS1 had a, it's more of a statement than a question, but maybe you can elaborate on it. You know, Tim says that, you know, IBC is, the, is that thing that so many of us have wanted for ledger ecosystem to ledger ecosystem communication. Absolutely. You've seen this outside of the blockchain realm, but as it pertains to blockchain technology, as it evolves, we're now in 2020. Where do you see this going over the next couple of years? So as I say, I expect IBC to be deployed in production soon, you know, this year. Um, there is, uh, there, there is, as I said, there's a hackathon, uh, uh, SF Blockchain Week has the Unitize conference and hackathon that starts in July. And there'll be a continuing no set of, of, of sort of stunning deployments of interop, you know, with, with, with both IBC, but also, for example, the um, uh, uh, Ethereum to Cosmos bridge just got rolled out by, by Suma One and Keith. So there's lots of interop activity happening. People have sort of, you know, crystallized that they need to do this and crystallized that, yeah, there, there isn't going to be one winner any more than there's one currency or one database, right? You know, the, 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 the world needs multiple standards there for a variety of reasons, some of which I touched on here. And so I believe that, that, that we've now crossed a technical threshold such that people can start really to do, you know, uh, um, real proof of concept systems with this stuff and be able to rely on it getting to the point of production where you can have real production systems with, you know, multiple different blockchains communicating with each other for money transfer and, and supply chain and so forth. So, so I think it's, a, it's, you know, people are starting to really internalize that its time has come. But again, with that first wave of blockchain enthusiasm, it's really easy to think, oh, it can solve all these problems. It can really help a business at the C level to, you know, in, in terms of decision of what's this stuff valuable for, 
to focus on those leverage points of high integrity, coordination among, among, among potentially untrusting parties and enabling me to cooperate with more people more efficiently than I used to be able to do so. Awesome, really great points. Last week at our June 3rd event, um, we had one of the technology leaders from Custom and Border Protection uh, Agency on board. Where do you see the role of regulators on, on this? I mean, are they doing enough? Are they not doing enough? What, what's, you, what's your take on it as someone that's been working with smart contracts since the late 80s? Right. Um, so uh, the answer, are they doing enough? Are they not doing enough is of course, yes. Um, uh, I've been pleasantly surprised, you know, I've been sort of both appalled on sometimes and mostly pleasantly surprised on the care with which a lot of regulators are approaching this stuff. Um, the, you know, and, and the thing is, this touches all spectrum of things. So it's easy to look at the, you know, the flare and flame about ICOs. Um, but, but, but I'm a big fan of strong decentralization that works well with existing businesses, right? I mean, I, I was delighted at the, in some sense, at the, at the statistics around U.S. Uh, uh, freight, where 90% of the packages transit on a truck of a company that has 10 or fewer trucks, right? It is astonishingly more decentralized and promoting a uh, small and medium-sized business um, to be able to really strongly and safely collaborate with each other across national boundaries, across use cases with large companies in a way that they really have, you know, can have high assurance and integrity. All of those are really exciting. Most of those don't require regulation at all. They just require us to do stuff. Um, all of the things that raise our assurance, you know, there's some level of, wow, I can get more, tr more tracking of, of certain kinds of things, but all of us need that for higher assurance business for look for reducing the cost of trust, right? For if I can have high assurance that I can easily hand off unsafe cargoes, it's a lot easier for me to manage doing unsafe cargoes, which means if they're actually really valuable, suddenly I'm able to share and manage them and have more customers for this stuff that is otherwise expensive and hard to manage. And I have increased the value for everybody, right? So, so there's all these areas where, where, where just increasing the assurance both simplifies systems and enables more collaboration with more parties. And, you know, if you can make collaboration safer, you get more collaboration in the world. And that's a, and that's a, that's a, a worthy goal from both a personal and a business perspective. 